This is um, Chapter 10, Nursing Care of Women with Complications After Birth. The objectives for this lecture are as follows. Uh, first, describe signs and symptoms for each postpartum complication. Identify factors that increase a woman's risk for developing each complication. Explain nursing measures to reduce the risks for developing complications. Describe medical and nursing management um, of postpartum complications. Explain general and specific nursing care. Compare and comp contrast mood disorders in the postpartum period. So the first complication we're going to discuss is um, shock. Shock is defined as a condition in which cardiovascular system fails to provide essential oxygen and nutrients to the cells. I like to think of it as, frankly, inadequate perfusion of uh, body tissues. It can be caused um, by um, many different um, etiologies. There are several different types of shock, and we'll talk about a few of them right here. Cardiogenic, and if you look at the word cardio, you probably think heart. And cardiogenic shock is basically when the pump fails for one reason or another. Hypovolemic, um, look at the word again, hypovolemia, meaning too little volume. So an example of hypovolemic shock would be uh, hemorrhage. If there's inadequate blood volume, then it's going to be hard to perfuse tissues adequately. So a woman who has a postpartum hemorrhage would be at significant risk for hypovolemic shock. Anaphylactic shock, um, this is uh, when someone is exposed to some sort of substance that um, they have an um, uh, allergic reaction to. This often causes uh, closing of the airway, swelling of the lips and tongue. Um, it can be fatal very quickly if not treated typically with epinephrine and Benadryl. And finally, septic shock is uh, an overwhelming infection. So we'll talk a little bit about postpartum hemorrhage um, and hemorrhage in terms of shock as it tends to be um, one of the most common postpartum complications. According to the book, it occurs in about 4% of all deliveries. Um, it can be defined as early or late. Early meaning that it occurs between 20, it, it occurs within 24 hours postpartum. Late can be anywhere from 24 to 6 weeks postpartum. Um, remember that during pregnancy, the woman's blood volume increases significantly between 500 and 1,000 mLs. And part of the reason for that, not only to help um, uh, grow the fetus, but part of the reason for that is so that if the woman has any bleeding after um, birth or during giving birth, that um, she is able to compensate because she has extra volume. Um, major um, risk for hypovolemic shock um, is that one, it interrupts the blood flow to body cells. So if you don't have enough volume, you can't get blood to all the tissues. Um, second, it prevents adequate and normal oxygenation. That probably makes sense. If you don't have enough blood volume, you're not able to get enough blood to all your tissues. And remember, oxygen is carried on the, blood, on the hemoglobin of the red blood cells, so therefore um, you're going to have inadequate oxygenation. If you have in inadequate oxygenation, you're also going to have issues with nutrient delivery and waste removal. Some signs and symptoms. Tachycardia is usually um, one of the first signs and symptoms that's present. Um, also, um, you will see changes in blood pressure. Um, you'll see a falling systolic blood pressure. Um, so you'll see a decreased pulse uh, pressure as the systolic blood pressure um, becomes closer to the diastolic blood pressure. Um, that's called a narrowing pulse pressure. You also will see that the woman may become pale, cold, and clammy. Um, what happens during shock is that the most important tissues and organs are perfused. Um, so therefore, blood essentially gets shunted from the extremities and from the periphery 
to maintain perfusion to the most vital organs, heart, kidneys, brain. As shock progresses, you will note mental status changes. If you think about it, if you don't have adequate perfusion, if you don't have adequate oxygenation to your brain, you're going to have mental status changes. And then finally, um, you'll also see decreased urinary output. Once again, as um, the lack of blood flow reaches the kidneys, the kidneys will be able to function less effectively and therefore will have, in that, will have decreased urinary output. Um, because postpartum women have a slow pulse, um, you do need to be hypervigilant about um, hypovolemic shock or infection. So you look at the pulse, and if it's above 100, you do want to have a high degree um, of suspicion about either hypovolemic shock or infection. The other important thing to think about is to look at other signs and symptoms that could be indicative of hypovolemic shock or infection. We'll talk more about infection a little bit later in the presentation. So um, let me first talk about medical management of a patient in shock, um, particularly a postpartum patient in shock, and then we'll speak specifically about nursing care. But I think it's important to understand the medical management um, because you'll, as nurses you'll be um, involved in that process as well. So first and foremost, if it is an issue with a postpartum hemorrhage, then you obviously want to find and stop the um, uh, source of the blood loss. Next, if, we, if the woman has lost volume, then you want to give her volume back. So first and foremost, that would be in, the term, in terms of IV fluids. Um, so she'll be getting IV fluid hydration. Um, oxygen um, will also be administered. And this probably makes sense as well. It, when someone is hypovolemic, they're not, they don't have as much blood to uh, perfuse all the organs, so you want to give them um, oxygen so that the blood that they do have can be as saturated as possible. Remember that folks that are in hypovolemic shock or have inadequate blood volume will often feel dizzy, weak, lightheaded, short of breath. So giving them oxygen can help with the shortness of breath. It also can touch um, the anxiety piece because these folks will have kind of an impending sense of doom and can get quite anxious, um, which can cause them to hyperventilate, breathe more quickly. So applying oxygen um, can be uh, very helpful uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it may also be important to um, insert a Foley catheter. Uh, in the last slide, remember I talked about the fact that the kidneys can be affected because of the inadequate perfusion. So if you uh, um, insert a Foley catheter, you can very closely monitor urine output, which will be crucial to monitoring um, the effects of the hypovolemia. And then finally, and this probably makes sense, she may require blood transfusions. That's why um, one part of typical blood work uh, for someone um, uh, during either prenatal or um, labor and delivery will be to do a type and screen so that um, uh, it is known what her blood type is um, so that if she were to need a transfusion, um, it could be done um, expeditiously. So let's talk a little bit about nursing care. So frequent vital signs. Never underestimate the value of vital signs. I talked about the importance of the pulse, but also looking at temperature because um, you always want to have a degree of suspicion for infection. Looking at blood pressure, like I mentioned, um, in shock you will often see the systolic blood pressure drop um, and come closer to the diastolic uh, pressure, and that's called a narrow narrow pulse pressure. Um, and um, ultimately in shock, the blood pressure will continue to drop, 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 drop to the point where you may not be able to assess a blood pressure. So you want to stay on top of that blood pressure and look at trends. If you see a trend of the blood pressure continuing to creep down, 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 you need to be um, communicating with the provider and um, uh, anticipating um, more interventions.
Um, along with vital signs, oxygen saturation. You're probably having this person on O2 in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a nasal cannula um, or a non-rebreather, um, but you want to be assessing oxygen status. Um, you want to assess for the um, amount and the type of the lochia. Um, depending on where the woman is in the postpartum period, um, like we talked about in the previous lecture, the lochia is going to be changing during the um, days postpartum. So if you see a change in the lochia, um, or um, uh, for example, a change in the amount or the color, or if um, the mother begins to pass clots, things such as that, you want to be aware of that. Um, you also want to be looking out for a perineal hematoma because remember a woman can have um, uh, hemorrhage frank blood from the vagina but also there could be a hematoma which would be a collection of blood that perhaps you can't visibly see so you want to be aware of that possibility and on the lookout for that. <clears throat> Um, you also want to um, think about um, the uh, fundus and you want to be assessing the fundus. Um, if the fundus is firm with bleeding, there may be um, a vaginal laceration. Um, so you want to keep that um, uh, possibility in the forefront of your mind. Um, you also want to look at the skin, assess the skin of the woman. If you note petechiae, um, or excessive bleeding, more than you might expect from um, like a venipuncture site, um, or if you note oliguria, um, lack of urine output, um, you may want to consider some sort of clotting problem. Um, and we talked already about measuring intake and output. You're going to be giving this person IV fluids and likely they'll have a Foley catheter in, so you'll be able to measure INOs um, quite closely. Um, you want to be looking um, for signs of anemia. If this person is hemorrhaging, you will um, the, the the change in the hemoglobin and the hematocrit can change quite rapidly, um, and the symptoms can occur quite rapidly. Some of the most common symptoms related to anemia would be dizziness, lightheadedness, short of breath, particularly short of breath with exertion, um, feeling as though the person is going to pass out or faint. Um, this person should not be changing positions uh, quickly. Um, any position change going from lying to sitting to standing should be done slowly because this person can get lightheaded quite easily and quite quickly. Um, oftentimes this person will be provided with iron supplements will, which will be more of a kind of longer term uh, aid as opposed to the blood transfusions which would be a short term aid. Um, also, this person's going to need emotional support. This can be very traumatic for the woman. Um, so as a nurse, part of your role would be to provide the emotional support for this person, um, both during the um, immediate um, uh, um, episode, but also um, moving beyond it as well. So what are some of the causes of early postpartum hemorrhage? And remember that Early postpartum hemorrhage occurs during the first 24 hours um, after birth. So number one cause is uterine atony. Um, so when we say um, atony, what that basically means is that the uterus um, becomes what we call boggy um, and um, it lacks its normal muscle tone. Typically, you should be able to very distinctly feel the fundus of the uterus. After birth, it is going to be about at the point of the umbilicus, and it's going to recede um, about a centimeter each day postpartum. So within 12 days or so postpartum, uh, the uterus should return to its normal size. Um, during the course of this time, you should be able to feel the fundus um, because that muscle um, will be um, uh, uh, contracting and firm. Um, if the uterus loses its 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 uh, firmness and becomes boggy, that can um, put the woman at risk for um, hemorrhage. <clears throat>
Um, atony can be caused by um, over distension of the uterus. Um, it can also be caused by retained products. Um, for example, when the placenta was delivered, if, um, if the entire placenta uh, did not um, uh, deliver and, and products were retained, that can be a cause um, of um, of hemorrhage. Also prolonged labor can cause hemorrhage um, and um, use of drugs during labor that um, cause relaxation of the uterus can, can um, potentially lead to hemorrhage. Um, so a couple of things to think about. Um, you want to be very um, diligent postpartum um, assessing the height of the fundus. Also remember that if the bladder is distended, that can cause the um, fundus to be um, pushed um, off to the side. Um, and so it's important always to remember that um, you know if you're having an issue in terms of uh, assessing the the fundus um, or if there's a concern about some sort of postpartum issue um, you know making sure that the woman has emptied her bladder so that you can do a real accurate um, thorough assessment um, and remembering um, that you will always want to be um, assessing for um, the amount um, of uh, lochia um, and um, collecting the um, uh, peripads and monitoring the, um, the lochia in that way. So how do we um, care for, um, let me go back just a sec, how do we care for a um, mother with um, uterine atony? Well, um, remember in, in a previous uh, lecture, we've talked about massaging the fundus. Um, so if the fundus becomes boggy, um, if you want to massage it, and um, that can help, that stimulation can help the uterus contract. Um, Remember that if the uterus is contracted and firm, it doesn't need to be massaged. Um, also, um, if the um, mother is encouraged to breastfeed, um, that is going to cause secretion of oxytocin, which also causes uterine contra contraction. Um, <clears throat> Remember, too, um, that there are um, other drugs that sometimes um, are used to increase uterine tone. Um, for example, methogen is one that can be used postpartum to increase methogen, um, excuse me, uterine tone um, and reduce um, postpartum hemorrhage. And remember that um, lacerations um, can occur during pregnant, or excuse me, during delivery, um, and you want to be aware of those that possibility um, and assessing for that. Um, and remember that. Um, blood loss during, um, or excuse me, with a laceration is usually bright red because it's fresher. Um, and it's going to look different than lochia. Usually lochia um, is going to be a darker um, blood. Um, and remember that a laceration will be a fairly kind of consistent maybe trickle of blood as opposed to lochia, which will come kind of in fits and spurts. Um, hematomas, uh, remember, are collections of blood um, in a certain area. Think about when you, um, you know, hit your leg against the, a table and you develop, a, um, you know, a little hematoma. That's a collection of blood in, you know, on your shin. Well, that can happen during um, labor and delivery or during the trauma. It can happen to the vulva. Remember the outside part, the um, external genitalia, but it can also happen um, inside the vagina. Um, so sometimes they, the hematomas might be very visible, while other times they may not be. Um, a couple of things um, that um, you can kind of think about um, as you're assessing um, for um, hematomas, um, thinking about um, continuing to observe for the lochia um, and continuing to watch vital signs. If you see a change in vital signs but you see no change in the lochia, there's no issue with uterine atony, um, you know, you want to be keeping the possibility of a hematoma um, kind of 
kind of in your, the forefront of your mind. Um, oftentimes, small hematomas don't re require any sort of in intervention as they will um, heal on their own, um, whereas larger ones may actually need to be opened up and have the clot evacuated. Um, a couple things in terms of nursing care that you can um, do to help um, ice packs to the perineum can help reduce inflammation um, and can also help um, with discomfort and then doing your frequent um, assessments and um, reassessments in terms of vital signs um, and um, observing um, for any changes in things that we've already discussed, lochia, uh, patient's pain, um, uh, the um, uh, fundus, etc. So late postpartum hemorrhage, remember this usually occurs um, 24 hours after um, and the most common causes are retention of placental fragments or sub-involution of the uterus. Um, and um, nursing care involves teaching the woman to report persistent bright red bleeding um, or return of bleeding after it has changed to pink or white. Remember how we talked about the evolution of the lochia postpartum. Um, if there's a change in the lochia, meaning that it had evolved and, and gone to pink or white discharge, but then all of a sudden there's new red uh, bleeding, that would be something that needs to be um, reported. Um, and um, a couple of things that you would anticipate in terms of nursing interventions would be needing to give IV medications and um, preparing for um, possible surgical intervention. Um, the woman may need a uh, DNC if there's uh, been placental fragments retained. Um, thromboembolic disorders. Um, remember that. Um, the pregnant um, patient is in a hypercoagulable state, so we always want to be considering um, and keeping in the forefront of our mind the possibility of um, clot formation. Um, remember that a venous th thrombosis is a blood clot within a vein. Um, and here are some of the causes and risk factors. One, venous stasis during pregnancy. Venous stasis just means that blood is not circulating um, uh, as um, uh, maybe quickly or, or as robustly as it normally would. Um, and so there's more blood pooling that occurs during pregnancy. And remember, when blood pools and kind of hangs out, um, it's at risk for developing clots. Um, pressure behind the knees, if the woman has been in um, the stirrups during the delivery process, um, also, fibrinogen levels increase during pregnancy, um, which is going to um, uh, make clotting um, uh, easier, whereas conversely, clot dissolving factors are decreased during pregnancy. So you have an increased ability to clot and a de decreased ability to dissolve clots. Um, and then also varicose veins develop um, uh, during pregnancy or can develop during pregnancy um, because of um, increased pressure. Um, there are several different types of thromboembolic disorders, and we'll talk a little bit about each one. Superficial vein thrombosis, um, that is when um, a um, clot develops in one of the superficial veins. Um, and this is usually the saphenous vein of the lower leg. And it's characterized by um, usually a painful, reddened, hard, warm vein. And these you can usually see. That's a really important distinctive factor. So if you look at your leg, you can see some superficial veins typically, um, particularly when people are pregnant and if they have any varicose veins, you can see them even more um, easily. But this is where a superficial vein thrombosis will um, evolve. And usually when someone has one, you can really see the redness, you can feel the firmness um, in the vein. Um, so that really should help you distinguish it from a deep vein thrombosis. Um, these are usually treated um, conservatively, um, usually with um, um, uh, uh, warm compresses, um, sometimes uh, compression stockings can be helpful, um, and elevation.
um, but they usually don't need any um, more intervention besides that, um, and usually it's self-limiting. And this person with a superficial vein thrombosis is not at risk for uh, developing pulmonary embolism. Now, a deep vein thrombosis is more... Um, uh, um, significant and has more significant uh, possible complications. Um, DVTs um, can um, be um, found anywhere in the leg um, and um, they can involve um, any veins from the feet all the way up to the femoral area. Usually the pain is characterized by calf or uh, pain behind the knee, um, and it's usually more diffuse than a superficial vein thrombosis, which is more localized. Um, this person may develop um, edema, erythema, and pain um, to a good part of the leg. It's not as localized as with the superficial vein. Um, there's a test called a Homan sign, which is pain with dorsiflexion of the foot. Um, I typically don't use it in my practice. Um, one, because in doing the test, you do have a risk of dislodging a clot. And two, I often look at other pieces of the puzzle, such as the history, the physical exam. And if I have any concern um, about blood clot, then I'll get an ultrasound, and that's the definitive diagnostic tool for me. Um, one of the um, things that we worry about with the DVT is we worry about the clot breaking off and going to the lungs and causing a pulmonary embolism. Um, and um, so in a pulmonary embolism, a clot forms in the um, pulmonary artery um, um, and can obstruct some part of the um, uh, oxygenation to the lungs. Um, Sometimes people will have very sudden, dramatic um, symptomology. Sometimes not as much, um, but you always want to keep PE in the back of your mind um, when you've got a postpartum uh, woman just because of the hypercoagulable state. Some of the signs and symptoms that this person may exhibit, chest pain, difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, um, cough, Sometimes they have um, back pain as well. Um, there may be decreased level of consciousness, um, heart failure. Um, sometimes this person will have just kind of vague symptoms and they'll have this uh, feeling of impending doom. Um, so this person will need um, interventions uh, uh, immediately. Um, and both in terms of DVT and PE, these folks are placed on um, anticoagulant therapy. Um, oral therapy would be by Coumadin. Um, IV therapy would be with heparin um, and um, subcutaneously with some form of heparin, whether it's a Lovenox or heparin. Um, the Typically, with DVT and with PE, the patient is placed on um, either heparin or Lovenox injections immediately while they're starting um, Coumadin because it takes about four or five days for the Coumadin to become therapeutic. So you want to get that person immediately anticoagulated, um, and that is done through the Lovenox. Remember that the therapeutic level for Coumadin typically is two to three. So that's what you're looking for with the INR, and that's the test that you measure when you have someone on Coumadin. You want their INR to be between two and three, um, and that's what's called therapeutic level. So what is, what is the nursing care involved um, with a woman um, uh, when we're concerned or we want to prevent um, thromboembolism? Well, you want to watch for signs of PE, and I've discussed some of them already. Dyspnea, coughing, chest pain. Um, teach the woman not to cross their legs because that can impede blood flow. And remember, we talked about venous stasis, so anything that impedes blood flow or allows blood to um, uh, kind of stay in one area can uh, put the person at risk for clots.
Um, avoid pressure in the popliteal space behind the knee. Um, early ambulation and range of motion exercises are key. And I think everyone probably knows that from our work in the hospital setting. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of um, uh, post-surgical patients, and one of the big things is to get them up and moving, um, do range of motion um, exercises. Um, that's why people are um, put on the um, sequential compression devices. You want to get the blood flowing. Um, and then if anti-embolic stockings are prescribed, the nurse should teach the woman the correct method of putting on the stockings. Um, anticoagulant therapy, like I mentioned, um, there's a couple of different um, forms of anticoagulant therapy, and it's going to depend a little bit situation to situation, but typically the person will be started on um, Lovenox and then bridged onto the Coumadin. Um, just remember that um, these folks are going to be at much higher risk for bleeding, so um, you know if they even get minor injuries, you just want to warn them that it will take their blood longer to clot. Um, that's the whole point, right? Um, they will be at risk for nosebleeds. They will be at risk for developing bruises um, where, where before they didn't. Um, and they should be instructed to use a soft bristled brush because um, th um, their gums will bleed quite easily. Um, and also warn them that um, you know when they go to the dentist, they should make their hygienist and their dentist aware that they're on Coumadin um, because of the um, increased bleeding. Um, very important, particularly with someone on Coumadin therapy, that they get their regular um, INR checks. Um, it is made much easier these days in most places because um, most facilities have um, what are called Coumadin clinics or anticoagulation clinics where people can go in very quickly and just get a finger prick and get their INR done and get the result right then and there and they can make any adjustments to their Coumadin level. It's um, evolved quite nicely um, in the last several years. Um, to make it a much uh, more manageable situation for people. It um, often can be quite burdensome because if their Coumadin levels are hard to manage, um, they have to go in quite regularly uh, for um, uh, maintenance. Um, and then also helping the woman cope um, with this condition. It can be uh, very challenging to be a uh, newly postpartum uh, mom and then also to have to deal with a complication such as this. Um, infection, um, remember earlier in the presentation I talked about monitoring vital signs and the importance of um, uh, looking at all the vital signs regularly. Um, you do want to have a high degree of suspicion for infection. Um, so um, risk factors can be cracks in the nipples of the breasts, surgical incision, tissue trauma, open wound, uh, retained placenta or blood clots, increased pH of the vagina after birth, um, or endometriitis, which is inflammation of the lining of the uterus. Um, so the dangers of um, a purpural infection, well, if there's a localized infection in the perineum, vagina, or the cervix, that can ascend to the reproductive tract, spread to the uterus, the fallopian tubes, um, and the peritoneum, which could cause peritonitis, which can be a life-threatening infection. So you really want to um, be vigilant about this. Um, and, um, you know, it is important um, to um, remember that the woman post-discharge also needs to have a high degree of uh, vigilance regarding um, fever, really up to about 10 days postpartum. Um, and remember, just in your, terms of your interaction with um, the woman postpartum um, and um, her interaction, proper hand hygiene um, helps prevent an, uh, the spread of organisms. Um, it's important that nursing and healthcare providers wear gloves when they're in contact with blood, body fluids, and potentially hazardous or infectious materials. Um, remember that... Um, a woman's white blood count can normally be elevated during pregnancy and after pregnancy. So that number alone is not going to give you enough information about the infectious process or the possibility of infectious process. So um, you've really got to put your thinking caps on and look at the whole picture.
Um, so what is nursing care involved? Well, our, our goal, um, first and foremost, is to um, prevent the infection. So use, in terms of your own nursing care, and teach, in terms of teaching to mom and family, hygienic measures. Promote, promote adequate rest and nutrition. Remember, folks that are run down or immunocompromised or um, stressed are at um, higher risk for um, infection. Um, teach the mom and the family about signs and symptoms of infection, and you um, in your nursing care need to be vigilant about signs and symptoms of infection. Teach the woman to um, apply perine perineal pads um, from front to back, um, and if the woman's on antibiotics, all the antibiotics should be taken as they are prescribed. Mastitis is um, an infection of the breast. Um, signs and symptoms um, can be redness and heat in the breast, tenderness, edema or heaviness of the breast, purulent discharge, and that may or may not be present, fever, chills, or other systemic signs of infection, and then an abscess can form um, uh, during mastitis. Typically what happens in mastitis um, is that um, there um, is um, an area in the breast that um, becomes um, inflamed and infected um, because of um, microorganisms that have um, entered usually through small cracks in the um, nipple uh, during uh, uh, breastfeeding um, and that provides kind of an um, entry point for bacteria. Um, and um, infection can be initially um, localized but it can become systemic and um, as I mentioned abscess can form if the infection becomes walled off so sometimes um, incision and drainage is needed um, treatment typically is um, in the in the form of antibiotics and mild an mild analgesics or pain relievers the um, um, Mother can continue to breastfeed with the unaffected breast, and it's usually recommended that she um, breastfeed with the unaffected breast um, first, and then pump and discard the milk from the affected breast. Um, you don't want to avoid um, expressing the milk from the affected breast because um, that can lead to engorgement, which can cause stasis of milk, which can just worsen the symptoms. So you want to make sure that that milk gets extracted, and usually it's done uh, by pumping. Um, you can apply uh, heat, which um, allows more blood flow to the area, which can promote healing. Um, and massage of the area can help um, improve milk flow and reduce the stasis. Remember, stasis is a good way to develop clots when we talk about blood, and it's a good way to develop um, infection when we're talking about um, uh, milk stasis. You want to encourage um, the mom to... Uh, take in good amounts of fluid, wear a supportive bra, and provide emotional support. This can be a very challenging um, uh, episode for the mother, um, it, particularly if she's a first-time mom and uh, she um, is really um, trying to uh, breastfeed her infant, um, so she will need some emotional support to um, help her through this this time. Um, and typically, uh, once it's resolved, she can continue to um, uh, breastfeed. Um, Subinvolution of the uterus. Usually after birth, the uterus returns to normal size, like I talked about earlier in the presentation. Remember, after birth, the uterus is usually at about the uh, point of the umbilicus, and it usually um, reduces in size about one centimeter each day, and that's what's called involution. So sub-involution is slower than expected um, involution or failure of the uterus to return to its normal pre-pregnant size. Um, like I mentioned, normally the uterus descends at the rate of one centimeter per day. So some typical signs um, of sub-involution would be that the um, fundal height is greater than what you would expect it to be on a particular day postpartum. Um, if lochia rubra um, persists, if the patient has pelvic pain or fullness, um, or if fatigue is present. 
So um, what is the medical management? Well, um, it can include um, methogen, and remember, as I mentioned earlier, methogen promotes uterine contraction. So the, the idea being that if the um, uterus is maintained in a contracted state, it will continue to involute. Um, also, if there's infection um, ongoing, then antibiotics will be prescribed. Um, and sometimes, if there is um, retained placental fragments, a DNC will be warranted. So basically, when you're looking at subinvolution, you have to look at what the cause is and then treat the cause. If the cause is retained placental fragments, a DNC is needed. If the cause is infection, antibiotics are needed. What is nursing care? Um, well, education, key. You want to teach the woman what are the normal expected changes postpartum. So teach her about the involution of the uterus and have her report abnormal pattern if it doesn't seem to be um, reducing in size as you would expect it. Have her report change in the lochia, an abnormal change in the lochia. Have her report fever, pain, foul-smelling vaginal discharge. Provide her with comfort measures and then prepare her for possible surgical intervention, which would be a DNC, as I described earlier. And then if antibiotics or other medications are prescribed, um, ensure that she understands what the medications are for, what the dosing is, what the possible side effects are, and what the expected outcomes are. Um, the final section of this presentation is discussing mood disorders um, during, or excuse me, du during the postpartum period. Um, so what is a mood disorder? Well, it's a pervasive and sustained emotion that can color one's view of life. And there's a wide spectrum that we'll talk about, particularly in relation to postpartum. So first is the postpartum blues. Sometimes it's called the baby blues. This is actually quite common after birth. Uh, between 10 and 20 percent of women postpartum experience this in the U.S. Um, and um, it, um, it's, it's an instance where the woman can have periods where she feels down. Um, she, this is typically a self-limiting um, uh, period where the woman is essentially needing to adjust to her new role um, and once um, that adjustment um, has happened then the postpartum blues typically pass. Um, now if the symptoms are more severe then we typically think about postpartum depression or postpartum psychosis. Um, I want to differentiate between these um, uh, a bit more than the slide does, so I'm going to um, focus first on postpartum depression and then on psychosis. But generally speaking, both of these can impair one's perception of reality. Um, they are both more serious and typically persist much beyond the initial postpartum period. Usually the manifestation occurs within four weeks after delivery, and it they can both interfere with the mother's ability to care for the infant, um, and maternal infant bonding can be affected. Um, so let's look at postpartum depression. Um, there are a number of risk factors that um, uh, can place the mother at risk for developing postpartum depression. Um, number one, inadequate social support. Um, so imagine um, a single mom, for example, one who doesn't have um, much financial support or financial means. Um, having a uh, new baby who's um, completely dependent on uh, her could really put her um, at risk for uh, depression. If she has a poor relationship with her partner, if um, there are life and child care stresses, if there are financial stressors, if the woman has low self-esteem, self um, and if this pregnancy was not a planned pregnancy, um, it can certainly put the um, woman at risk for postpartum depression. In postpartum depression, um, the uh, woman has difficulty coping with this new role that she has. Um, and um, there can be strained relationships, 
there can be difficulty with communication, um, there can be financial stressors, um, there can be um, difficulty um, adapting essentially to the new role. But it is important to note, and this is going to contrast with um, psychosis, that um, the woman is still, you know, fairly firmly implanted in reality. Um, some typical signs and symptoms of postpartum depression would be lack of enjoyment in life. Um, the, the medical term for this is anhedonia. Um, and this basically means that um, the woman does not find enjoyment or pleasure in things that normally or previously she would have. Um, another is lack of interest in others, um, other people, other things. Intense feeling of inadequacy, inability to cope. Um, sometimes the woman will feel helpless or hopeless. Um, sometimes there will be difficulty concentrating. Either the woman um, kind of um, spaces out or she's very fidgety. Um, sleep is often disturbed. Um, and this is, is sometimes difficult to tease out because um, with a newborn, sleep is going to be disturbed at its baseline. But if the woman's dealing with depression, this, the disturbed sleep can be compounded. Um, and oftentimes these folks feel constant fatigue. Um, so how do we care for these folks? Well, one of the mainstays is getting them hooked up with resources to help them develop coping skills. So looking at your multi multidisciplinary team at your facility, what resources do you have available? So I try to get these folks into counseling, um, whether that's through a psychiatry, psychologist, social worker, um, therapist. Tap into any of those resources that are available um, and see if you can get this person into counseling. And also see what other support resources there are out there in the community for this person. Be a sympathetic listener. Um, elicit feelings, um, try to get the person to open up and, um, and discuss how she's feeling. Um, be always aware of um, postpartum depression as a possibility. So observe for signs of sleeplessness or chronic fatigue. Um, help the woman identify what resource resources are there for her. Um, Talk to her about the importance of exercise and nutrition. Um, help her identify ways that she can meet her own needs and um, refer her to support groups in the community. Postpartum psychosis um, is um, kind of the uh, another um, stage. And this, this often is an impaired sense of reality. Um, Psychosis is much less common than postpartum depression. Um, the two most common that can occur are bipolar disorders and major depression. Um, and the big things that we are, are concerned with here is the possibility of suicidal or homicidal ideation. So very important if you are um, concerned about a woman um, in postpartum psychosis um, to screen this person for suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation and refer this person to the appropriate counseling. Um, the, one of the challenges here is that most of the medications used to treat um, uh, um, psychosis um, pass through the breast milk, and so therefore uh, breastfeeding would be contraindicated if this person's going to be on medications. Um, finally, um, if you have a mother and a newborn that are homeless, um, this is going to be a particularly challenging um, uh, combination. Um, very important that this person is identified early on and that um, multidisciplinary team is on board to help this person identify um, resources out there in the community, um, ensuring prior to discharge that this um, new family unit has a place to stay and a way to access help, um, and do what you can to um, help um, facilitate referrals to community resources.
um, before this mom leaves the hospital because once she leaves the hospital, um, you don't know if you will ever have um, follow-up care um, with this uh, patient and um, newborn and you may not um, be sure if the mom will be able to have follow-up care. Um, this is the end of the uh, presentation on uh, chapter 10. Um, one question for you all to ponder, what are the key signs and symptoms of a bleeding laceration postpartum? And I encourage you to think about how um, that bleeding might um, compare and contrast to um, uh, other types of bleeding that we talked about in the presentation.